What up, Wizards? Dev from the place here with Igby and the Chicken. Two cats in one video. It feels like it's been years. We are here for day two of Outlaws at Thunder Junction. I can't not say it like that. I'm going to have to stop myself eventually. This can't go on for two weeks. Either way, there's more Thunder Junction cards. That's why you're here. And there's another, like, almost 50 of them. So, again, we really can't waste any time. Will I do the timestamps this time? Will I remember to actually do the timestamps I promised you this time? If so, they're over here. If not... I'm sorry. Uh, a lot of people were like, oh, I thought that was a joke that you didn't do the timestamps. No, I just totally forgot to do the timestamps. So maybe they're over here. I'm not sure. I'm so sorry. But yeah, let's get into the commons and uncommons first. Good news. There's only two commons from the whole day. So let's take a look at Lone Shark along with Desperate Bloodseeker first. A well, Lone Shark is a joke that had to happen eventually. It's four mana, three and a blue for a three, four shark rogue when it enters the battlefield. If you've cast two or more spells this turn, you get to draw a card. You can plot it for three and a blue. So you plot it for its casting cost. You cast it for free. You draw yourself a card, a little three, four draft card. Not actually that great, but Desperate Bloodseeker on the other hand is actually better than like a lot of the uncommons we're about to look at. This is two mana, one and a black for a 2-2 two, two vampire with lifelink. When it enters the battlefield, target player mills two cards. That's actually kind of interesting. A little upgrade on Child of Night, you know? <laughs> two mana, 2-2 two, two lifelink is not good enough by itself, but at very least in draft, it's a very playable two drop creature. And really cool on this, by the way, you can commit a crime with it. You can target your opponent for the mill. And then suddenly, you've committed a crime. It's a novel way to commit a crime, but obviously in your own mill decks, this is a pretty valuable card too. Now moving into the uncommons here, we're going to look at three or four slides in a row of cards that I think are just kind of eh. But we got to get through them. I want to see every card in the set, and some of these are cool, but again, it's largely a section full of eh cards. You can call this the section if you want to. But let's take a look first at Tomb Trawler and Prosperity Tycoon along with Nomadic Possum here. Now Tomb Trawler is two mana for a 0-4 golem. It's an artifact creature. You can pay two to put a card from your graveyard on the bottom of your library. Save yourself from them Jace mills and then breach the multiverse mills, but it's not good. <laughs> I'm not trying to apply the card is any good at all, in fact. Now Prosperity Tycoon over here is four mana, three and a white for a four two human noble. And when it ETBs, you get one of them one one red mercenary dudes that taps at sorcery speed to give a creature you control plus one plus zero. Am I really going to read that text like all spoiler season? <laughs> you know, it makes a mercenary guy when it ETBs. You can also pay two and sack a token to have Prosperity Tycoon gain indestructible till end of turn and then you tap it. So it's one of these, but it costs way too much. You know, I guess it gives you a dude when it comes into play. You can sack that dude. You can not sack that dude, whatever. You can sack a clue or a blood token. That's kind of interesting, right? But altogether, you have to have like six mana up to give this guy indestructible the turn that you play him, and that's just like too much. Draft card? Is it even a good draft card? Yes, it gets indestructible. It's probably at least halfway decent, but still not amazing. Now, Nomadic Possum over here is the cutest. Man, there is that, but he's also got text. Let's read it. Three mana, two and a green for a 3-3 three, three Possum mount. He has saddle one, and whenever he attacks while saddle, he gains plus one, plus two till end of turn. Then you may return any number of creatures that saddled it to their owner's hands. So that's kind of neat, I guess. You can throw stuff back in your hand, get an ETB trigger, something like that, I guess. You can replay them after combat so they're untapped and can block now. I guess that's kind of fine. But even though it's a three mana, three, three, it does nothing outside of limited. But I guess it's a solid creature there for your limited mounts deck i think that's going to be a thing but moving along we got to look at thunder lasso along with marauding sphinx and rictus robber over here now lasso is three mana two and a white for an equipment that equips for two but when it etbs you can attach it to a guy you control equip creature just gets plus one plus one and whenever equip creature attacks tap target creature defending player controls so neat little tapper equipment here i like that it equips itself as soon as it comes into play but it's still you know just fine I don't think it's amazing. Am I playing this in limited? I kind of like tapper dudes in limited, but I, I also like when my tapper guy dies, I still get the ability to throw this on another guy and it becomes a tapper dude. So like maybe it's okay there. A little better than I'm giving it credit for, but nowhere outside of that format. Also feels like a Wonder Woman reference, but I'm still not 100% sure. Marauding Sphinx is five mana, three and two blue for a three, five Sphinx rogue with flying, vigilance, 
and Ward 2. Those are decent abilities. Whenever you commit a crime, surveil 2. This ability triggers only once each turn because no fun allowed, right? Now, even though it triggers only once each turn, I think this is a pretty solid little limited guy right here. One of the more solid limited dudes we've seen so far. Again, these are all good abilities. Your opponent wants to kill this guy. They're going to have to actually commit some mana to it. If you untap with it, it's pretty easy enough to commit a crime. You get some extra value, surveil some stuff. I don't know. Solid enough guy. Again, like no play out of limited or anything, but this is one of the kind of better limited bodies at a lower, you know, rarity that we've seen so far in the set. Or at least that we've seen today. I should probably amend that slightly, but let's move on to Rictus Robber here. This is four mana, three and a black for a four three zombie rogue. And when it ETBs, if a creature died this turn, you get a two two blue black zombie rogue creature token. Congratulations. You can also plot this for two and a black. So I always like when we see stuff you can plot for less than it actually costs because I don't really want to pay four mana for the four three here. I guess you could be paying four mana for six power worth of stats and like that's actually not too bad but if i'm paying you know no mana <laughs> on that turn for six power worth of stats that's cool and it's gonna give my opponent you know some decisions to make when i attack in with all my dinky little guys like you sure you want to kill this 2-2 because then i get a 4-3 and a 2-2 for effectively free but even if you can't find out a way to get the 2-2 you still get a 4-3 for free on a later turn and that might be okay again this is limited we're talking about <laughs> but outside of that i'm I was going to say I'm not short. No, I'm dead short. This doesn't see any standard play. But in limited, it's a, kind of an interesting card. More black cards, please. Here's Binding Negotiation. Thanks. Here's Congregation Griff along with it. And Stubborn Burrow Fiend. Now, Binding Negotiation is two mana. It's one on a black for a sorcery. Target opponent reveals their hand. You may choose a non-land card from it. If they do, they discard it. Otherwise, you may put a face-up exiled card they own into their graveyard. Cool way to commit a crime, and this might actually almost be standard playable. It kind of depends on how good plot is, but I guess we already have, like, adventure, too. You can just throw an adventure creature into their graveyard, which is, like, kind of a cute use for the card, too. It's just, like, altogether not the worst thing in the world. Like, I've played Pilfer in a deck <laughs> here recently, so I can see myself potentially playing this. Again, especially if there are, like, cards with plot that you have to look out for and it looks like there's probably going to be a few congregation griff is up next though this is three mana one a green and a white for a one four hippogriff mount nice and it's got flying and lifelink and when it attacks while saddled it gets plus x plus x till end of turn where x is the number of mounts you control and i saddle this for three which is kind of a massive saddle cost actually that's Three's a lot. I'm <laughs> sorry, but I wish that it was just like it got plus X plus X where X is equal to the power of the creature that saddled it or something like that. Then it would be awesome with the lifelink and all that. But, you know, you got to have like three other mounts out before this starts actually being like halfway decent. But You know, maybe it helps you win a race and limit it. It's a flying creature with lifelink. Those are almost always good. It's got a big old booty on it, too. So I do like a lot about this, but not really in constructed. A uh, stubborn burrow fiend is kind of neat, actually. It's a one and a green for a two-two badger beast mount. You notice all these little animals that we're getting in this set. It's almost like they're getting us ready for bloom burrow. Whenever stubborn burrow fiend becomes saddled for the first time each turn, mill two cards. Then stubborn burrow fiend gets plus X plus X till end of turn, where X is the number of creature cards in your graveyard. And this saddles for two, which is a slightly more reasonable cost, but anything beyond saddle one, I just don't love. <laughs> it's easy enough to get like a two power token and saddle this, and then suddenly you got like make your own Lurgoif, or make your own stick fingers, or whatever version of that card you like the most. Cruel Somniface, Souls Lost, there's like a million of these at this point in magic history. And this is not the best one, <laughs> I would say. A lot of these cost just a couple of mana at this point. And so I don't see this being like amazing, but it does mill two cards it's one of the few lurgoids that actually like self mills in a decent way for you but and you probably got creatures to tap down to saddle it either way i think that that these like self mill golgari decks that want to actually play stuff like stick fingers and standard right now are a few and far between and b a little too stacked in terms of the deck list to be able to make room for something like this so not too sure about it but there are multiple like self mill cards in this set so maybe in draft you just go on like a self mill plan and then get in with your badgers for a million every Turn. It could happen. But hey, we got to keep moving on here. Let's look at Lassoed by the Law, along with Intimidation Campaign and Wrangler of the Damned. Now, Lassoed by the Law is four mana, three and a white for an enchantment. When it ETBs, exile target non land permanent and opponent controls until Lassoed by the Law leaves the battlefield. Feel like I've heard this one before. What's the extra gravy? When it enters the battlefield, you get one of them mercenary guys. 
one of the little mercenary token guys. So it's a, yeah, it's one of these banishing light, oblivion ring, whatever. But for the extra mana, you get a guy that's playable and limited. That's all there really is to it. Now, intimidation campaign, it kind of makes me sad. I got to say, am I a 40 year old man saying sad? It makes me sad because my actual feelings on the card don't mask them with lingo now this this is supposed to remind you of disinformation campaign which was kind of an awesome card but i don't think this is as good intimidation campaign is three mana one of blue and a black for an enchantment when it etbs each opponent loses one life you gain one life and then you draw a card and whenever you commit a crime you may return intimidation campaign to its owner's hand so you just keep playing it and drawing cards and doing a little damage every now and again dev you like incremental damage right you like draining the opponent this seems fine not really i don't like playing three mana per drain i get you get to draw a card too but you're not like really interacting with your opponent in any way the cool thing about this information campaign is they had to discard a card that's really cool so i'm not super happy about it. I like the reference. I get your references, and I enjoy a good reference from time to time, but I play Magic. This isn't Family Guy or anything, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, this is the place for references. We're in Thunder Junction. There's plenty of references here, and I kind of enjoy them all, but at the same time, um, you took a card that was already kind of difficult to play with and was borderline not actually very good, but a lot of people loved it, and then you made this thing which people are going to be like, oh, it's like this information campaign. I'm going to play this card. It looks good. It's actually, I don't think this card's actually very good at all. And I think it's going to disappoint a lot of people. It's pre-disappointing me. So, sorry, let's move on to some hopefully better cards. Like Wrangler of the Damned, maybe. This is five mana, three, a white, and a blue for a 1-4 human soldier with flash. And at the beginning of your end step, if you didn't cast any spell from your hand this turn, create a 2-2 white spirit creature token with flying okay so it's kind of neat you know works again with adventures works with plot obviously and even a couple of other mechanics if you can find a way to like discover i think without casting a spell does that work i'm not sure <laughs> either way there are other ways to cast spells but not from your hand so i don't know thing is actually really sweet you just like rely on activated abilities and stuff for a turn maybe <laughs> and just get like spirits it's just really cool that she has flash but she's also like priced way out of standard five minutes too much for this but it is kind of a neat little you know like spirit farm thing i like getting a token every single turn out of it but obviously it's a bit too slow for standard at present but the flash is pretty intriguing hey speaking of references let's take a look at cunning coyote and resilient roadrunner i get it now cunning coyote is two mana one and a red for a two two coyote it's a coyote with haste and when it etbs another target creature you control gets plus one plus one and gains haste till end of turn it also has plot one in a red man some of these mono red like plot cards are actually looking kind of nice you know we got to see what is it like the kiln fiend that flies and has plot yesterday it's, he looks awesome it's like one of my favorite cards of the day today we get to see this like these are almost worth like the thing is with these mono red like cards that actually want to attack they have to be worth skipping a turn in your aggro deck and that's that really is a lot to ask so these try to make up for that by being like relatively strong cards this definitely is now resilient roadrunner honestly isn't half bad either it's two mana one and a red for a two two bird with haste and get this protection from coyotes come on it's got three mana Resilient Roadrunner can't be blocked this turn except by creatures with haste. So you get the Ginger Brute ability on not Ginger Brute. So that's good. It's just cool to see that, you know. I also like that even though it does cost a lot to activate this ability, it's another way to get this ability in your like Agatha Soul Cauldron decks so that like all your dudes can go unblocked if they have counters. Like neat little thing there, but just any two mana 2-2 two, two haste is like halfway playable almost in and of itself i kind of like that there's interaction between this and the coyote <laughs> it's like you plot the coyote on turn two and you play it for free on turn three after you play the road runner the road runner gets plus one plus one they both swing in like it's it's i don't know dude <laughs> it's it's all kind of cool but obviously the the whole fun of this is that it's a it's a reference to a thing i forgot what it's i have no i've never seen this in popular culture in my entire life i've completely i've never i don't know what this is but yeah good good job <laughs> Good job, Wizards, and good job making them actually like halfway, if not playable cards, then at least interesting. Okay, in case you didn't catch it with my tone shift there, this is where the cards take a slight shift up in quality, at least to my mind. So let's take a look at Visage Bandit, Visage Bandit, an unscrupulous contractor. Now, Bandit is four mana, it's three and a blue for a 2-2 two -two shapeshifter rogue, but you can plot it 
for two into blue. So yet another card that the plot cost is less than the mana cost. You may have Visage Bandit enter the battlefield as a copy of a creature you control, except it's a shapeshifter rogue in addition to its other types. So that's kind of neat. You know, you can plot this and then just like bank it for like who knows how long until you get a huge guy out. <laughs> You know, or you can just like get a decent guy out the next turn on turn four or something and then throw this down for free. And suddenly I have two of them that can set up combos and stuff if you wanted to. Or you can just have two very strong creatures out, which also seems like a good thing to do. So I don't know. I like this. I like most like three mana clones, right? Because that's a decent little discount there. And this one's especially cool. Again, you can just like kind of bank it and there's not a whole lot of ways for your opponent to really touch it outside of i don't know a card we just looked at but like you know again um there's not really that many ways for them to touch it and then you can just kind of wait until you have your like six mana dude in play and suddenly again you got two of them for free so i don't know dude it actually seems like very sick in a lot of ways so it's also cool that like you can plot this and then throw like a dude with haste down and then like get another copy of it for free and just swing like a million on turn four there's a lot of cool ways to use this card now, Unscrupulous Contractor is three mana. This is two and a black for a three, two human assassin. You can also plot it for its mana cost, two and a black. When it enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice a creature. When you do, target player draws two cards, loses two life. We got a scorpion like this in standard right now that I actually already really like. What is it? Fell Stinger? That guy's awesome. <laughs> I haven't used him in a deck in too long, but this guy's probably not quite as good as that card, but he's going to be free sometimes, you know? <laughs> sometimes it's going to be a free two cards, like a free sign in blood. Where do you sign me up, you know? <laughs> I just kind of like that about the dude. I think that he's a little better than he looks at first glance because a body, I know you got to sacrifice a thing, and sometimes he's going to be the thing you sacrifice, but a body in two cards for effectively free? The turn you play it, it's actually kind of a heck of a deal, my guy. So <laughs> kind of, kind of want to give this dude a tryout. I'm not sure he's going to get a jersey in the end, but I at least want to try. Up next, we got Longhorn Sharpshooter and Aloe Alchemist. Now, Sharpshooter is three mana. He's doing a red for a 3-3 three, three Minotaur Rogue. We got Minotaur support, everybody. I, I was hoping we'd get some, but anyway. This is a three mana, three, three reach. And when it becomes plotted, it deals two damage to any target. You plot it for three and a red. Now that is a lot to plot. That's so much, but at least it does something. This is what I keep saying about these plot cards. It's like, you have to skip a turn. You have to on turn four, you do nothing to plot this card. And that never feels good in a game of standard. But now we're starting to see cards. And so is Aloe Alchemist, by the way. We'll get to it in a second. Now we're starting to see cards that actually do a thing with the turn you plot them. So that you're not like skipping your turn effectively. And that's really, really good. This is just a shock when you plot it. So I don't think that it's quite good enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's, that's really a lot for a shock. But it's a shock that comes with an eventual body and stuff. But either way, the only reason I'm freaking out a little bit here is because I just want to praise the idea of plotting actually doing the something <laughs> at least something the turn that you play it so with that in mind let's take a look at aloe alchemist now, this is two mana one and a green for a three two plant warlock with trample and when it becomes plotted target creature gets plus three plus two and gains trample until end of turn you can plot this for one and a green so same plot cost as the mana cost it kind of sucks you can only plot as a sorcery it'd be way better if you could give something trample and a giant boost at instant speed the card would be one of the better uncommons in the set, I think, for like for green decks and stuff, it would be actually amazing. But just even as it is, I kind of like this a lot. You know, th two mana for a three two trample is kind of at least on par in standard for where you want to be with your two drops. And aside from that, it's also a sweet little pump spell, dude. It's actually a great pump spell. So I don't know. I kind of like this maybe in those like picnic ruiner gruel decks that you keep seeing on like arena every now and again this could be halfway decent you know double striking trampling picnic ruiner coming in you get a pump spell that still comes with a body with trample that interacts with all your other pump spells well because it has trample i don't know like there's a spot for this day one is it good enough i'm not too sure but i do like that like both modes on it are cheap and pretty effective too Let's move on. We got to keep plowing through these uncommons and take a look at Spinewoods Armadillo and at Knife Point. Now, Armadillo is six mana, four and two green for a seven, seven Armadillo with reach. That's a big boy. He's also got Ward three. You can pay one and a green and discard him to search your library for a basic land or a desert card. Reveal it, put it in your hand, shuffle, and you gain three life. So kind of a herd migration mode on there that also allows you to grab a desert, which... 
is really cool because there's like two color deserts in this set. That's nice to be able to grab a dual land with this. Later on in the game, you get yourself a little 7-7 seven, seven reach, hard to target. I don't know. The guy's cool. <laughs> I've always liked like land cycling cards. And even though we've seen a few in the last few sets, I haven't really gone on to see too much standard play. I'm still going to like cards like this, and you can't stop me. Now, at knife point is three mana, one a black and a red for an enchantment. As long as it's your turn, outlaws you control have first strike. Remember, outlaws are assassins, mercenaries, pirates, rogues, and warlocks. Whenever you commit a crime, create a 1-1 one, one red mercenary creature token with all the mercenary abilities, but this triggers only once each turn because no fun allowed. You skip turn three to play this enchantment in your deck that plays about cares about creature types. So it's already kind of a weird, funky card to play in the first place. I'd actually much rather this be on a body that had one of the creature types. That would be pretty sweet. But you also have to devote slots in your deck to committing crimes to your opponent just to get 1-1 one, one dudes. And even that just triggers once per turn. Why is this all the way up here in this video? When I first looked at it, I was like, oh, oh no, it proved pretty good. But like now I look at it, I'm like, eh, <laughs> I guess. You can get a 1-1 one, one on your turn and then a 1-1 one, one on your opponent's turn. So that's cool. I guess it's possible to trigger the turn that you play it on curve, but it's... Kind of difficult to do that. Mostly you have to devote mana to triggering it. And then you only get like a... So I'm paying three mana. And then I have to wait a turn to get a 1-1 one, one for three mana. And then I have to wait another turn to get a 1-1. One, one. It takes like four turns of actually triggering this. Which is easier said than done. To get like enough 1-1s one, to justify paying three mana in the first place. I, li I dislike this card the more I think about it. So we should probably move on. Wait a minute. All your guys get first strike. Okay. So you can use all the mercenaries to make one dude huge and get in with first strike. Like maybe that's the whole point of it. That's still bad. <laughs> I guess a global effect to all your dudes have first strike is probably way better than I'm giving it credit for at the, at the moment. And at least that does something the turn it comes into play. Throw this down, attack with your first couple of guys. They have first strike. I don't know. It's not good. <laughs> That's my final verdict. Nah. Yes, play it in your Outlaws Commander deck. But let's move on here to Fleeting Reflection, as well as Caught in the Crossfire. Now, Reflection is two mana, one and a blue for an instant. Target creature you control gains Hexproof till end of turn. Untap that creature. Till end of turn, it becomes a copy of up to one other target creature. By the way, it doesn't have to be a copy of a creature you control. Just a copy of anything. So I kind of like that you can just make your dinky little 1-1 one, one guy <laughs> or something into whatever giant dude your opponent is swinging with, you know, like, and just kind of bump them up against each other in combat. So you can kind of almost play this as a removal spell if you have a dude you're kind of willing to sacrifice. That's an interesting mode. But what this mostly is going to be is um, give my guy Hexproof and turn him into a Venerable Rod Priest until end of turn, <laughs> and then target him with more stuff. It's going to be gross. I actually think this is maybe playable in that, like, Bant Toxic deck that's been going around lately. And winning tournaments and stuff is actually a pretty sick deck. It's really good. It's kind of scary. Um, and this could slot right in. They probably don't want too many things that cost two mana to protect their guys. They have so many good options for one mana. But the blowout potential on this is so great that, you know, I invalidate your removal spell and also... My random dude is a venerated rot, venerable rod priest, and now you're dead. <laughs> like two mana later, you're dead. So I don't know. It's probably a little too tempting for those players to not at least try it. I caught in the crossfire. This is actually a really interesting card. This is two red mana for an instant. That's neat. It has spree plus one mana. Caught in the crossfire deals two damage to each outlaw creature. For plus another one mana, <laughs> caught in the crossfire deals two damage to each non outlaw creature. So in your outlaws deck, Right? This is three mana at instant speed for two damage to everything. But you could you could also, I guess, pump four mana <laughs> into this and blow up like everything on the table almost, you know, like guaranteed. Interesting card against like the Boros Convoke decks. You could just play Brotherhood's End or something like that. But at the same time, this is instant speed, which is really very neat. You don't see that on too many red sweepers. So I kind of like this. A good bit. I'm not sure it actually sees too much play. I mean, it's like, what is Vampire's Vengeance just like better than this card? You know, and like how much play does that card see? Not enough. In best of one, Vampire's Vengeance, halfway okay. But either way, I just like the modality on this card. Um, I like that it's good against Outlaws, but also it's really good in Outlaws. I imagine that if you have like three Outlaws on the table and you blow up like three out of four of your opponent's creatures with this spell, that... It's very situational, right? But even if you only kill like half their dudes with it and get in with the rest of your outlaws, you're probably doing at least okay, right? So I don't know. Neat spell. I like red sweepers. 
Now we are rounding the corner on the uncommons, just so you know. We've only got three more of these to look at today, so we're getting to the ones that I think are the best. Let's look at Arid Archway and Servant of the Stinger next. Now, Archway is a desert, it's a land that enters the battlefield tapped. When Arid Archway enters the battlefield, return a land you control to its owner's hand. If another desert was returned this way, you get to surveil one. You can also tap this for two colorless mana. No big deal. Just it just taps for two colorless mana. This is kind of reminiscent of those bounce lands that you see in them commander decks and such. Really good in landfall. And this is pretty good in landfall. Hey, it'd be really cool if we had some nice landfall trigger stuff in standard or maybe even in this set. Uh, more on that later. He says as though he he doesn't know there's a landfall card in this very video. <laughs> Either way, it might be good with a card that we'll see a little bit later today. But one way or the other, just a pretty sweet little card, man. Any land that taps for double mana is always going to be pretty freaking sweet. And in your desert deck, yeah, you get a little surveil. It's some extra candy. You know, that's all good. But just any land that taps for two, I'm going to be kind of excited by every time. A Servant of the Stinger is a neat little guy that I keep going back and forth on, right? He's two mana, one in a black for a 1-3 human warlock with death touch. When he deals combat damage to a player, if you've committed a crime this turn, you may sacrifice Servant of the Stinger. If you do, search your library for a card, put it in your hand, and then shuffle up so you get a sack him for a demonic tutor. <laughs> it's kind of, that's powerful, right? I mean, I know he's got to not only get in for combat damage, but he also has, you have to have committed a crime. So two things have to line up that may be, again, like easier said than done. Second time I've used that phrase in this video, but I think it's important to at least acknowledge like, okay, you have to have a card in your hand or some other thing that's able to commit a crime in the first place. So check that box. That's not going to happen every single turn. You don't have all the cards in your hand every turn. You know, Sometimes you have to get in with them. That's not going to happen every turn, right? So you have to acknowledge the dude probably sucks a little bit, but they gave him death touch and at least a respectable toughness so that they can't just like chump him with a 1-1 one, one or a 2-2 two, two and not have to worry about him anymore. Like They actually have to throw something relatively sizable in front of him to actually deal with him, right? And honestly, I kind of think there's going to be lines where you throw this down on turn two. Right, your opponent plays a creature on their turn two. You went first, you know. You get to play this on turn two. They play their first creature of the game on their turn two. On turn three, you just get to like go for the throat or cut down their two drop, get in with this, and then immediately go get whatever you want. Like you gotta sack your guy on turn three. You're going down on board position, but you're getting whatever you want. I think it's actually fairly easy to sack this dude early in the game, so long again is if you went first and your opponent has a creature to target with a removal spell, then you should be able to sack this reasonably early, like more than you think. So I kind of don't hate this dude like at all. I think he's kind of great, but I do have one more card that I want to look at in the uncommons today. And it's lively dirds. This is two mana, one and a black plus for a sorcery with spree for plus one mana. You search a library for a card, put it into your graveyard and then shuffle up for plus two mana. You can return up to two creature cards with total mana value four or less from your graveyard uh, to the battlefield. That's actually awesome. <laughs> Just for four mana, return a couple of two drops to the table. Like there's a ton of decks that could really use that. Not to mention like Ellis of Core, you know, Bartolome, Vron, like all the creatures in my favorite deck in standard, Aristocrats, they all cost a couple of mana and they would really like a card like this that can immediately just grab a couple of them, put them back into play. Hey, Life Gain, you want a Voice of the Blessed and an Amalia at the same time for four mana? Yeah, I think they might occasionally want that. You might think that a card like maybe Sarah Paragon would be better than this. And honestly, you might be right. <laughs> right. But at the same time, like being able to get back a three drop and a one drop, two, two drops, one, four drop, you get back one Shieldred with this card. Seems like it's kind of just okay. And you have so many options. I like reanimator spells and you guys kind of know that about me, but I especially like these sort of value reanimation spells that don't let you do all of the broken things, but for a decent cost, they let you do something really synergistic. Is that a word? Maybe synergetic, synergistic. That's gotta be it. Either way, Again, there's going to be certain like combo-y creature decks in standard, again, aristocrats and such, that are going to really like stuff like this. Like maybe even Insidious Roots, it plays plenty of two-drop creatures that it wants in play at any given time. There's kind of a lot of them in that deck, and it triggers Roots when you use it. So I don't know, just all kinds of silliness, all kinds of decks the thing could go in, and I think that it's one of, if not the, strongest uncommon of the day. But hey, everybody, we made it to the rares and mythics together. That's right, we're going to batch the mythics together with the rares today because there aren't too many mini mythics but that said i guess i'll go ahead and throw you a bone we'll kick it off with a bang and look at not only two mythics to start off this section but two mythic reprints that actually look like they might be 
Pretty ridiculous and standard. Phenomenal cards. Let's look at Archangel of Tides and Terror of the Peaks. Pretty jammed to have both of these cards back in standard, dude. Archangel is one and three white for a three five angel with flying. As long as an Archangel of Tides is untapped, creatures can't attack you or the planeswalkers you control unless their controller pays one for each of those creatures. As long as Archangel of Tides is attacking, creatures can't block unless their controller pays one for each of those creatures. This is probably at least halfway decent out of sideboards against decks like Boros that are going to try to attack you with like 500 guys on like turn four, you know, this is at least maybe okay against them. Archangel's always been like halfway decent in the standard environments it's been involved in in the past, or at least the one standard environment it was involved in in the past. It was kind of a sideboardy card. I expect it to do the same here, although we're seeing like kind of multiple like death and taxes e cards or at least taxes e cards in this set and in this video i actually think the best card from today is a kind of taxes sort of card so we'll get to it don't worry but it's just cool to have archangel back man this is always a sweet creature to have access to and there's a bunch of angel decks in the format already that specifically might really like to play this four drop but oh terror of the peaks my boyfriend's back five mana three and two red for a five four drago with flying spells your opponent's cast that target Terror of the Peaks costs an additional three life to cast. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Terror of the Peaks deals damage equal to that creature's power to any target. One of my favorite lines of text in all of magic. A little pandemonium that works just for you on a stick. A big fat flying stick too that just ends the game by itself some of the time. If your opponent wants to do anything about it, it kind of has ward pay three life. Just really, really sweet. <laughs> Really, really sweet dude right here, man, that I'm going to be very happy to have back in standard. His price has jumped, jumped. As a matter of fact, his price has been like really high for a long time. Even when he was in standard, his price was very high. So good to get this guy a reprint, maybe bring the price down a little bit, hopefully, so I can actually own a copy for paper. That would be great. But either way, really sweet to have this dude back in standard. I hope that, hope that I have this guy in my arena collection already. I'm not sure, but <laughs> not sure which set he was in <laughs> recently, but it's just good that he came back so fast. Right. But if you haven't had the joy of playing with terror, of the peaks yet, let me tell you, it's a whole lot of fun. Your opponent has to do something about it or they're just done for. I'm not sure this is necessarily better than like Bone Horde Dracosaur or some of the other five mana options we have in standard like Aklazots, right? But I still think I want to try him in like, you know, red, black, mid range or something. Like he looks really good in these Rakdos stacks that we see going around. So there's a lot of five mana options, including some five mana options in this very set, like Rakdos himself that I want to try out in those Rakdos mid range decks. But there's always going to be a spot somewhere for Terror of the Peak. And to be honest, he might be pretty decent in like the odd combo build too. You know, there's that deep root pilgrimage deck that just infinitely puts out one, one Merfolk. Well, now they can kill you with this guy. So that's kind of, that's kind of neat. You know, maybe you throw a copy of it insidious roots or something. And every time you make plants, you hit the opponent. All of this could work, but it's all a little too cute. But that's the best thing about terror of the peaks is that all your best ideas are a little too cute. And when they come off, you just feel happy <laughs> when you actually are able to pull the Terror of the Peak stuff off. You're the happiest person in the world. So this I'll always support this card in standard. It should be evergreen in standard. Yes, the Terror of the Peak. Terror of the Peaks 2024. This card's great. All right, let's bring it down just slightly. Take a look at some rares, but some of these are hype too. Like Bruce Tarl. Bruce, 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 man, you look great. But there's also Bonnie Paul, Clear Cutter, and Seraphic Steed. Now, Bruce Tarl, Roving Rancher, is four mana. Two, a red and a white for a 4-3 Legendary Human Warrior. Oxen, you control, have double strike. We knew that line of text was going to be in the set. It's just still great to see it. Whenever Bruce Tarl, Roving Rancher, enters the battlefield or attacks, exile the top card of your library. If it's a land card, create a 2-2 White Ox creature token. Otherwise, you can cast it till the end of your next turn. That's cool. You know, ETBs, get a card or an ox. <laughs> next turn, if he's still around, attack, you get an ox or, again, kind of draw a card. I don't know. He's kind of neat. He basically makes like four fours in a way because your oxes have double strike. He is a cowboy, baby. That's a song from when old people were young. But <laughs> either way, <laughs> like this is just a really sweet little like cow commander <laughs> I just didn't know i needed that in my life but even despite the three toughness i think that i want to try the dude in standard and if you're going to build a cow deck in standard just to meme and stuff this dude basically has to be a four of right so expect him on stream eventually but is he going to be actually playable in standard i Kind of highly doubt that. You know what this guy actually is? Changeling Commander. Next card. And that next card is Seraphic Steed. A green and a white for a 2-2 Unicorn Mount with First Strike and Lifelink. 
When Seraphic Seed attacks while saddled, create a 3-3 White Angel creature token with flying. That sounds kind of neat, but you saddle it for four. That's the heaviest saddle cost that we've seen so far. It's kind of a lot, and I also kind of hate that this thing does not fly. It looks like it flies, like it's a Pegasus Uniform. Corn, uniform? Is that a word? But it looks like a Pegasus Unicorn, but maybe those are just cloud wings. Maybe it's the wings of whatever saddled it. That's Who knows what's going on here, but it sure looks like it flies to me, but it doesn't. I feel... Like, I have been robbed at this point, but still. A 2-mana two 2-2 two, two first strike lifelink is, like, kind of acceptable stats, <laughs> right? And even if it's going to uh, die when you send it in, at least it's kind of going to replace itself with something bigger than itself that actually flies. Maybe that's the reference here, but either way, when this does die, um, well, not when it dies, but, yeah, when it attacks while saddle, get a 3-3, three, three, and if it somehow survives that combat step because you have, like, Tamiyo safekeeping or something like that, then it's going to get in for another combat step, make another 3-3. Three, three. So this actually looks kind of good to me, but I don't want to be fooled by it either. I think that if you're like on the draw and this is your two drop, it's probably not like super great, but maybe first strike lifelink is way better than I think it is, especially against certain aggro decks in the format right now. Now Bonnie's here, everybody. This is the Paul Bunyan reference that we kind of all expected. Bonnie Paul clear cutter is six Mana, three, a green, and two blue for a 6-5 legendary giant scout with reach. When clear cutter enters the battlefield, create bow, a legendary blue ox creature token with this creature's power and toughness are equal to the number of lands you control. Whenever you attack, draw a card, then you may put a land card from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield. That's all really good text. That's such good text, and like sometimes this is just going to straight up put like 12 power into play like really easily. Often it's going to put even more power than that. <laughs> into play but at the same time it's six mana six mana cast this card um that said there's multiple like seven mana creatures that i don't mind ramping to in standard right now you know like i built civic ramp a few times it has like fading hopes and counter spells and stuff in the lower end to get tempo and then it just ramps into a titan of industry and like the deck kind of sucks a little bit but like, a card like this might actually help you bridge that gap between like five and seven mana so you can drop something a turn earlier against you know the aggro and mid-range decks to completely invalidate them because if you actually get to this against some decks in the format i'm not really sure what they do about it they kill bonnie paul they still have you still have a 7-7 seven, seven or whatever. <laughs> you know, If they kill the ox, then suddenly you can just like return this to your hand, cast it again, or blink it somehow and get the ox again, which is disgusting. You know, <laughs> Drawing cards ain't half bad either when you attack. It's kind of neat that this can do something the turn it comes into play, so long as you have a creature to attack with the turn that you cast it. So I don't know. I'm beating it up a little bit too much for its six mana casting cost. I actually do think there are like playable things about the six drop in your Simic or like green blue X ramp deck. But let's move on to Vadmir, New Blood, as well as Riku of Many Paths. We've taken a step up a little bit here. This is two mana, Vladmir is Vodmir, sure. Two mana, one and a black for a 2 2 legendary vampire rogue. Whenever you commit a crime, put a plus one plus one counter on Vodmir. This ability triggers only once each turn, no fun allowed. As long as Vodmir has four or more plus one plus one counters on it, it has menace. And lifelink, so a 6-6 six, six menace lifelink eventually. It's going to have to take a couple of turns. You're going to have to cast a removal spell the next turn, and then a duress or something the next turn, and then another removal spell. And so <laughs> suddenly he's like a 2-mana 5-5. Five, five. Like this dude actually does grow pretty fast, even given the once-per-turn restriction, especially when you consider, again, I've said this a bunch of times this turn, or this, this turn? <laughs> is this is this, a, is this one turn all the spoiler season? I've, I've said this already a lot this spoiler season, but, you know, you commit a crime on your turn, then their turn, then your turn. So it's actually a little bit easier to grow this guy quickly than you think it is. He'd be a 4-4 four, four fast. So, you know, I don't I don't hate this, but this is another card that you have to work for <laughs> a good bit. I don't think he's ever going to actually get the two keyword abilities because your opponent is going to shoot him down long before that. You know, I also let me say this, too. Let me say this, too. Real quick, before I get off this card, I do like the line of like playing him on open mana. And if your opponent tries to cut him down or something, mostly just cut him down, then you can commit a crime at instant speed. Maybe cut down their guy. He grows, cut down fizzles because he's too big for a cut down. Like that's a line that could actually take place in a sort of black mirror match or something. So I don't know. It's a, it's a cool card to think about. And I think that it does line up kind of nicely. Again, this is one of those, just like the uncommon we were talking about earlier, play it on turn two, turn three, kill that guy, get in with your three, three. It seems like a pretty clean line of play. So I think the guy's cool, but is he good enough? Age 
age-old question. I'm pretty sure the answer is no. I think I like Ayara's Oath Sworn a little bit more than this, all things considered. And that card sees absolutely no play. But maybe it's easier to commit a crime than getting for combat damage. I'll admit that. But I'll also move on to Riku of Many Paths right here. This is three mana. Green, a blue, and a red for a 3-3 three, three legendary human wizard. Whenever you cast a modal spell, choose up to X, where X is the number of times you chose a mode for that spell. Okay? But there's modes on the thing that cares about modes, so listen up. Mode 1, exile the top card of your library. Till the end of your next turn, you may play that card. Mode 2, put a plus 1, plus 1 counter on Riku. It gains trample till end of turn. And Mode 3, create a 1-1 one, one blue bird creature token with flying. So, really kind of neat. You know? I, I think this is actually very sweet as like a modal commander, which is something I... Didn't know that we needed until I saw it. And I was like, oh yeah, that totally makes sense. <laughs> There's enough modal spells to make a modal commander deck and do really fun stuff with it. Riku gets a little bit bigger, can trample in. Sometimes that'll just kill somebody on a commander table. I kind of like that, you know? Um, I'd like that this isn't restricted to once per turn. So if you're actually able to cast multiple modal spells in a turn with multiple targets too, then you get to like do multiple things on this card a bunch of times. You get to just, like technically draw a bunch of cards and just fill your board with tokens. And I know it's all kind of Christmas land and it's probably never going to happen in standard but if you play this dude in standard on turn three turn four actually untap with him and have like two targets for your modal spell then suddenly you're actually kind of cooking a little bit you know you get a bird and a card or you get a card and riku becomes a four four you get in like there definitely are lines with this in standard where it could see play but he doesn't have any real protection he doesn't really do anything the turn he comes into play so he really seems like more of a relatively cheap commander and he's going to be fun there Let's keep it pushing here because we got to look at Roxanne, the Starfall Savant over here, along with Malcolm, the Eyes. Now, Roxanne, I got to tell you guys, I really like this card, <laughs> like a whole lot. It's not as good as I want it to be. That does not stop me from really, really liking it. Five mana, three, a red, and a green for a 4-3 legendary cat druid. Maybe that has something to do with it. Whenever Roxanne enters the battlefield or attacks... Create a tapped colorless artifact token named Meteorite. When, with Meteorite enters the battlefield, it deals two damage to any target. It also has tap, add a mana of any color. Whenever you tap an artifact token for mana, add one mana of any type that artifact token produced. First of all, cat, okay, let's let's run that by you again. First of all, cat, I can just like call cosmic star storms down what an awesome creature that is <laughs> it looks like it comes from an unset or something but it's here in my standard which i guess makes sense maybe it's from the um the space set there's gonna be a space set like next year maybe she's from that plane i'm not really sure what's going on here but either way you get to call down comets with this cat druid that's ah oh, <laughs> that's just really really cool i like a thing that like basically immediately comes down and removes something on the table it's gonna do that nine times out of ten um, well, can it do it immediately? Does it, does it, is it tapped? Is it tapped? Create a tapped color? Come on. Why is the thing tapped? It costs five mana to cast this. So. I guess it doesn't actually do anything immediately, but still, you know, eventually you're going to have a few of these meteorites out. You're just doing a bunch of damage. I don't know. I'm, I want to live the dream with this. I don't think it's ever going to happen, but this is a card that I really, really like design wise, but I regret to inform you. It's probably not good, but you know, cards don't have to be good for me to like them. That's the fun thing about being a magic player. Malcolm, the eyes is up next, a blue and a red for a two, two legendary siren pirate with flying in haste. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, investigate. A two mana, two, two flying haste. <laughs> okay. That's pretty good. <laughs> Just in general, that's all right. Again, we saw that like flying kiln fiend yesterday, which is, Probably just generally better than this, but there's multiple like blue red artifacts decks in standard that are trying to be real decks. <laughs> and like maybe this helps them do that a little bit. I do like the investigate. It's like another copy of Gleaming Gear Drake, except it's bigger immediately when you cast it and you can swing immediately when you cast it. Like that's kind of an upgrade on Gear Drake like 90% of the time, even though this itself is not an artifact, which is. Sometimes the whole reason you play Gear Drake. Getting ahead of myself, I think this is good in multiple decks. You know, the Is It Artifacts deck and even just an Is It Aggro deck. It's probably going to like the idea of a two mana, two, two flying haste just in and of itself. And like, it kind of draws a card when it comes into play. It kind of replaces itself when it comes into play. So I don't know, dude. It looks like a very solid card in terms of just value, stats, and all that. But moving it right along, we got Step Between Worlds and High Noon up next. Now, Step Between Worlds is. A pretty hype card when you first read it, but I got my doubts. That said, let's read it first together. Five mana, three and two blue for a sorcery. You can also plot this for four and two blue. 
Each player may shuffle their hand and graveyard into their library. Each player who does so draws seven cards. Exile step between worlds. It's a time twister. Now, your opponent doesn't have to do it. If they want to do it, they can. So that's kind of crappy. <laughs> You're not forcing them to get seven fresh cards um, when they really would not like to do that or when they have more than seven cards in their hand or when they've set up the perfect hand. Now, no, they can just choose to stick with what they got, which is kind of sucky. Or if they're at zero cards... They definitely get that refill, baby. So I'm just not really, I'm not sure. I do like that this can be free. The turn that you cast it, that is great, especially considering you're getting seven fresh cards. What I was saying earlier really rings true here. You want to have the mana to play the cards on the turn that you get them, especially with a card like this. You don't want to tap out and then give your opponent the chance to use their fresh hand first. So you really want to plot this, but it costs six mana to do nothing on your turn. No deck can do that, right? Or at least... I don't want to say that because there's plenty of decks in standard that get like 50 mana by like turn six or something. And they could definitely like plot this and it not be a problem. But I just, I don't really see a spot for it. I think it's one of those cards you're supposed to see and be like, Ooh, it's time twister. And like, it's not really, it's not really time twister. So I don't know. I want to be hype about this. I always like when we see like shots at power nine references, but this isn't necessarily the best looking one I've ever seen, but like maybe it's busted in commander. Who knows? I, I I just wish I liked it more than I do. Now, High Noon appears to be a just strictly better rule of law. That's neat. It's two mana, one, and a white for an enchantment. Each player can't cast more than one spell each turn. You can also, though, pay four and a red and sacrifice High Noon to have it deal five damage to any target. Draw! That's, I think, what's going on there <laughs> when you actually pay the five mana. Um, so, yes, it's strictly better rule of law, I'm pretty sure. Um, well, kind of funny to me, though, that this is in the color combination that would hate to play with it the most <laughs> in standard right now. Like it's in Boros, you know what I mean? Um, and the currently Boros Convoke deck plays how many spells a turn? Six, something like that. Feels like it a lot of the time. So I'm just, I'm not sure they want it, but maybe some kind of like Jeskai control deck wants something along these lines. And if you get multiple copies of them, it's actually way better than multiple copies of Rule of Law, right? Because you can just convert them into five freaking damage, which is a lot. Of damage, you know, you take out a creature with this, almost any creature, or later on in the game, you just like sacrifice three of them and kill your opponent <laughs> pretty easily. So, I don't know. I actually think this is a great card for control decks in standard and maybe even in the main deck, but I kind of doubt that. If there is a Jeskai control deck in standard and there kind of is, it's like it's it's trying to be a thing. It's like, I want to play Lightning Helix in control. You know, so if there is a Jeskai deck in standard that wants to play some control -y stuff, and I could see them slotting this in at least in the sideboard. But then again, I guess this could also, if you want to be super cheeky, this could just be your win condition. You know what I mean? Like you play this card, you bring it back with cards like Campus Renovation and Repair and Recharge. There's a million of these in standard. Brilliant Restoration to bring back like all of them from your graveyard at the same time and then sack them again. And so your only win condition is sacking this card. Like, you know, you could, you could be a little freak and do something like that. That, and I honestly kind of support it. But up next, we're moving to single card slides, everybody. That means we're taking a slight step up in quality, hopefully. Let's take a look at Marchesa, Dealer of Death. This is three mana, Grixis colors, a blue, a black, and a red for a 3-4 legendary human rogue. Whenever you commit a crime, you may pay one. If you do, look at the top two cards of your library. Put one of them into your hand, the other into your graveyard. That's pretty good. It doesn't say only do this once per turn. That's probably because you have to pay mana for it. Um, so, you know, that means you're probably not going to go infinite with this anytime soon, but it's still nice that if you have the mana laying around, you can like duress and go for the throat and for just a couple extra mana, get a super great card advantage. Like maybe even bank something for further, like later reanimation, like who knows like what your plans are, but there's plenty of ways that this could effectively read whenever you commit a crime, pay one, draw two cards. <laughs> if you're going to use the thing you put in your yard later. So that is really, really good effectively card advantage you know if you're playing a one for one thing against your opponent like go for the throat you're basically paying an extra mana to two for one the opponent which is really it's very very good you know and especially if you're doing stuff that commits crimes for free like getting in with the graveyard trespassers the example i'm probably going to keep using in this in the spoiler season i got to come up with another one but yeah get in with the graveyard trespasser pay one mana draw cards like ah that sounds so freaking good dude so I don't know, man. This card actually looks like it might be great. I've seen a lot of people mostly just focusing on the fact that it's Marchisa in a cowboy hat and they're mad because, like, don't you have a kingdom to run or something? And it's like, hey, stop taking things too seriously. Sometimes things are – sometimes they just do a cowboy set. You know what I mean? And, like, the villains are here. 
because it's fun and you like them and it's fun and you don't have to think too far into it. It's just, oh, hey, Marquise is here. That's cool. I like that character. So that's, I don't know. That's as far as I go with it. I got, I got too little time in my life to be thinking about like, well, don't you have a kingdom to run? This is stupid. I don't like this. Actually, I just like that it's a cool character like Marchesa and she's wearing a cowboy hat and she does a cool thing. Look at that text box. Text box is awesome. It's actually like almost playable and standard. Maybe even definitely playable and standard. So, I don't know. This is another one that's going to get tryouts and I'm pretty sure it may end up on the bench before the end of tryouts, but we're still going to try. You know, We're going to give it a shot, see what she can do. It's a cool card. Let's move on, though. <laughs> I wonder if I get a bunch of dislikes for that. Just, like, stop taking everything so seriously. It's a fantasy card game. It's cowboy set. Come on. Anyway, this is, I'm telling you, your life will be a lot better. You stop taking things so seriously. You can take serious things seriously. Definitely. There's a lot of serious things to take seriously. This, on the other hand, is a card game. So let's move on to Kellen Joins Up. This is three mana, Bant colors, a green, a white, and a blue for a legendary enchantment. When Kellen Joins Up enters the battlefield, you may exile a non-land card with mana value three or less from your hand. If you do, it becomes plotted. Whenever a legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. So that's a, those are both good modes. I like that. All of these join up cards appear to be like your legendary guys do stuff. So that's, that's a cool little thing for legendary creatures decks. But of course, I was talking about this earlier, you know, you want to play outlaws in your outlaw deck. You don't want to play random enchantments. Same thing with this. In your Legends deck, you don't want to play random enchantments. You want to play Legends. I'm playing Thalia in my Legends deck. Why do I play I don't play any non-creatures, you know what I'm saying? So this definitely has that going against it, but I really like this first line of text. You know, a problem with some of these enchantments, these like join up enchantments is like, okay, what does this really do when it enters the battlefield to give me any real value that's worth spending, in this case, three mana on it? Well, in this case, you just get, you get to cast a, another card. <laughs> like the thing you would have otherwise cast on turn three, just wait a turn, you get to cast that anyway, for free, which is really sweet to plot. Literally, like, any small card in your hand, that kind of seems fantastic, you know what I mean? Like, even if this doesn't get to, like, sit on the battlefield for too long, at least you got to plot that card, at least you get to play a card for free. So if you're going to pay three mana to play the card you plotted anyway, you might as well play this. So long as you have some breathing room, you're not going to die next turn or whatever. You might as well play this and then get the thing you're going to cast for free anyway, you know? So, I don't know. I kind of really like the first line of text on this card because it kind of takes away the pain of playing an enchantment like this and not really being able to do much the turn that you play it. At least you get a free spell later. So I don't know talking about this thing too much because to be honest, like even though I do like the legendary aspect of it, like, Oh, your guys get plus one, plus one counters. It's not like that big of a thing to be honest with you. I just kind of like the first line of text. Getting a free spell later is nice. Plus extra value in the form of this enchantment. Now, next up, we got to look at one of the newer cards from the day. This is Outcaster Trailblazer. Three mana, two and a green for a 4-2 human druid riding a big old lizard right there. When he enters the battlefield, add one mana of any color. Whenever another creature with power four or greater enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card. You can also plot this guy for two and a green, same as his mana cost. It's actually pretty sweet, man. I really like the design on this, too. I mean, if you plot him, yeah, you're skipping your turn three, basically, like in mono green. That doesn't feel great some of the time, but maybe you cast like a mana dork on turn two, so you actually have four mana, so you have a whole other mana to do other stuff. I don't know who you are or what you like to do, but either way, you cast this on turn, you plot this on turn three, you're not doing much, but you play it on turn four, suddenly it's ramp. You get like mana acceleration for casting this, and then you're probably able to put that mana towards casting something that will draw you a card now that this guy's in play. So, and you got a four powered dude, <laughs> you know, like all of that is, a really busted turn four, you know? So I don't know, man. I really like the idea of this dude just giving you green mana, whether you plotted him or not, you know, you cast him on turn three and then suddenly he just gives you an extra mana. So that's like mana up for another creature or maybe, I don't know, like a Tamiya safekeeping, like some spell like that or giant growth, <laughs> you go into combat with it. Um, you know, you giant growth and then you go into combat because you'll lose the mana otherwise. But <laughs> either way, just an extra mana is great. Like if you have, you know, five mana and you cast this guy, then suddenly it's really, really easy to double spell. You know, even if you just have four mana when you cast this guy, suddenly you have two mana to cast something else. And that's actually kind of worth it. So I don't know. I, I like basically anything that says free mana on it. It's a pretty decent accelerant. That'll also draw you a card or two over the course of the game. And that's pretty good in green. Oh, but you wanted a green creature to get hype about. Yeah, I think I can provide that. Here's Bristly Bill, the spine sower here. This is two mana, one and a green for a 2-2 legendary plant druid with 
landfall. There it is. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. You can also pay three and two green to double the number of plus one, plus one counters on each creature you control. That is a heck of an activated ability for Soul Cauldron. I just keep bringing up Soul Cauldron in this video, but still. Landfall. Plus one, plus one counters on guys. That's actually pretty sweet. I think we actually have a card like this in standard already, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Fairly certain we have an enchantment that costs two mana and basically does this, and it's not really played. So I'm not really sure. I hate to be too prickly here. Sorry. But I'm not sure that Brizzly Bill is actually that playable. But, you know, two mana for this kind of landfall trigger is pretty sweet. But he might not end up in, like, the mono green landfall-y kind of piles that you might think he ends up in. Or, like, the blue-green ramp piles with Tatiova or whatever. I'm not sure he goes in those. But there is currently a deck in standard that plays, like, 14 different Nuka Pena fetch lands that this guy might be really, really sweet with. You know, the Nissa deck. That either looks to play like a slow Gurk or a Jace and Millie out a million times, or maybe they play like a huge World Souls Rage with all their mana. This dude adds another dimension to that deck should they need it, because that deck often plays with like splendid reclamation effects and aftermath analysts. That deck often ends up getting like six triggers a turn off of new Capenna lands coming out of their graveyard and stuff. So with that in mind, this dude could make another creature or even himself like huge all in one turn. So, you know. Either nothing's on the other side of the table or you have a trample creature again like Slogurk or whatever. You just get in for a million because of all those landfall triggers. Like that could work and the deck could actually maybe devote like one slot to this guy. But that's probably where I see him going the most. That said, just moving to commander for a second here. It's also really nice to have this particular landfall trigger just sitting in your command zone for a reasonably cheap price. Even later into the game, you know, like you have to pay four commander tax, but it's like turn... 12 you're like okay yeah so i've got I've got that laying around in my landfall deck you know so this cheap commander for landfall that i think it's probably going to be like that's where it's most played but even in standard i think we at least got to try this dude out but we have made it to the absolute best rares of the day we've only got a couple more to talk about plus a couple that i missed yesterday that i think it's very important to bring up so before we get out of here though let's start with three steps ahead this is a blue mana for an instant with spree if you pay an extra one in a blue you can counter target spell so you got yourself a cancel right up, right there on the bottom rung of the ladder it's at least a cancel if nothing else so what's the extra upside what is the cancel with set mechanic doing this time around well you can pay an extra three to create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature that you control or you can pay two to draw two cards and then discard a card so i have seen people call this sublime epiphany at home that's backwards it's actually completely this is actually like way better <laughs> and so this is kind of like cryptic command at home if i had to Put an at home tag on it, you know, but it's nowhere near as good as Cryptic Command. But we are getting there, man. This is cancel plus sometimes catalog, right? Like draw two, discard one, and that is back breaking if your control opponent can actually pay for that. So I don't know, dude. Just those two modes together are great. Sometimes it's just going to be a cancel because that's all it has to be, but other times it's going to be a cancel to get you card advantage. It's going to be a cancel that even copies a clue token or copies like some important creature that you have in play or even just a cancel that at instant speed copies like a wandering emperor token and that's good enough because it put a body on the table and denied the opponent a play all that's good enough if you have the full whatever it is like seven mana to, is that right one two three four five six seven eight yeah the full eight mana <laughs> then like copy dude counter spell and draw two, discard one is a busted bunch of things to be able to do. But even if you're just doing two out of three of these things, it's going to be good enough most of the time. And remember, you don't have to use it as a counterspell. Like, it can just be a catalog if you need cards right now because you have to find that sweeper. Or if you need to bin a card because you want to reanimate it next turn. It doesn't have to be a counterspell. It can just be catalog. And it literally just catalog at instant speed. So, I don't know, dude. I think there's a lot to like about this card. It might actually be the best card of the day but it's to be honest that this is contended at all is kind of amazing because any other day i think this would have been the best card of the day this is probably the best cancel with upside with upside that i've ever seen like it's definitely in the conversation for like best cancel with upside ever so what what is what could possibly be anywhere near as good as that today well let's answer that question and take a look at Aven Interrupter. Uh, Aven Interrupter is three mana, one and two white for a two, two bird rogue with flash and flying. And when it enters the battlefield, exile target spell, it becomes plotted 
Spells your opponent cast from graveyards or from exile cost two more to cast. Best name I've seen for this online so far is Spell Quailer. I can't, I can't you know, take credit for that, but there are so many freaking cool things about this card, man. A 2-2 two, a two, two flash flying for three is like almost there. It's, it's almost there, but the body is real. The fact that it has flash is awesome. And... It can be used to counter counter spells like forever. You know, one thing that I missed in yesterday's video, a few of you got me on and I'm glad you did, is that if you plot a card, you can then only cast a plotted card as a sorcery. So you should never plot a counter spell, which is something I suggested doing with the new Jace yesterday. You shouldn't do that because you can only you can only cast plotted cards as sorceries. That means if a counter spell becomes plotted, it's basically useless, <laughs> right? So it's actually kind of nice to be able to flash this in and counter a counter spell forever and never have to worry about it again. But even if you're just countering a removal spell or something like that, they still have to wait a whole other turn. That's how plot works. They still have to wait a whole other turn before they can cast the spell. So it's kind of a remand on a body in a lot of ways. It doesn't draw you the card or anything, but it still gives you a 2-2 flying flash body that either counters a counter spell forever, counters a removal spell for now, which is important tempo, or maybe in some cases, most importantly, counters a sweeper right now. You know, it pulls the sunfire, the sunfire, the Pontiac sunfire. It pulls the sunfall back up to their hand and you get a new body. <laughs> it's actually really difficult to block. So, you know, the, how many games of arena have you played? where if it weren't for the sunfall happening this turn, you would have won the game. You know, you one more attack step, I win. This card's going to provide you that one more attack step while also being a body to attack with a good bit of the time. And even if your opponent can remove this, the turn that you, you know, play it, they still have to wait until next turn to play the plotted card. So this could see play and everything from like, White X Flyers, which is actually a deck. You ever have you played against like Ruin Lurker Bad on turn one into Deep Cavern Bad on turn two into Gix on turn three? This is a real deck, and this goes in it pretty well. If I had to guess of a place to put it, but it also goes in like Blue White Tempo decks fairly well, or even maybe Blue White Control. I think a lot of people are going to try to play it, but I actually don't think like straight up Azorius Control is the absolute best place for the card. Willing to be wrong on that, but I think the tempo this provides you, especially against more controlly decks, is going to be very, very important. Just, to me, not necessarily the best card of the day by leaps and bounds. There's a couple of cards that are really close to it in power level, especially that counter, that real counter spell we just looked at, but this is definitely going to be a card that sees play in standard almost no matter what. Mark my words, and it might actually be one of the better standard cards in the entire set by the time the dust settles and the smoke clears. Uh, but speaking of the best card in the set. I might as well bring up the fast lands that I never got to yesterday. These are probably going to be the actual best rares in the set, the ones that you should craft the fastest, you know. I actually just did a video about like the things I want most in the set and enemy fast lands was number 1 because I want to unlock aggro while we have this like completely full format for the next 4 or 5 months and then rotation hits. This is the biggest standards like ever going to be. So I really want to unlock and unleash all of the standard decks that need a chance to thrive, especially with Azorius Control being such an entity in the current state of the meta, right? So if decks like Boros are able to have their fast land on turn two, if decks like Aristocrats or those Black White Flyers decks are able to have like an un another untapped land besides Caves of Koilos, right? Basically anything in enemy color is it matters a lot here too. Golgari Insidious Roots decks really want an untapped land, but back to is it, you know, there's is it like Monastery Swiss Spear, kind of like Delver of Secrets decks that really would like to have another untapped land, man, because they need all that mana the first couple of turns. So these will massively impact standard on multiple levels, you know, by the way, one of them is also the green blue one. So that means Bant Toxic gets a little bit better too. And that's kind of, just keep that in mind. Just literally every single one of these will help multiple decks out day one. So these are maybe, again, end of the day, the best cards in the entire set. It's boring to say that they're lands, but again, these will affect standard on a much higher level than most of the cards in the rest of the set. Aside from that though, I pointed out yesterday that these um, big score cards that we're getting, not special guests, not breaking news, but big score cards with the set symbol, they, those are standard legal. They're gonna be legal in standard. And I made a big deal out of those and I talked about like three of them, but I didn't talk about a reprint that's gonna be standard legal from that same kind of bonus sheet. That's Torpor Orb. Torpor Orb. Torpor Orb is gonna be, <laughs> gonna be legal in standard and Pioneer for that matter. So like, 
I guess Amalia is just like toast in both formats. <laughs> but basically, being able to shut off like ETB triggers with a very difficult to get rid of in current format, you know, permanent type is going to be a big deal out of sideboards. And I could even see it seeing like the occasional play in best of one and stuff. But mostly as a sideboard all star, this deck is going to, this card is going to shut down all kinds of stuff that I personally really like doing. So that's very sad. But. I also have to be objective and admit that that makes it a very good, it's such a good card to exist. And I'm not super, I don't know if I'm like happy that it exists in standard or not, but like the fact of the matter is it does and we all need to get used to it. But cow pokes and cow girls, I think that's about all we got for today. So I'm going to mosey off, hit that old dusty trail. I'm gonna, That's all for the spoilers today. Sorry. if the, <laughs> I don't know enough cowboy cliches, so I just use the dumbest ones imaginable, but I guess that's, all, it's potentially funny, but probably not coming from me. Either way, just, I hope you enjoyed the preview video. Let me know how you felt about all the cards. Anything that I missed down there, I'm sure there's a few things. Maybe some stuff I got wrong. There's got to be something, right? Just let me know down there in the comments section. Hopefully, again, I remember the timestamps this time. I'm saying it so I can remind myself once I get into the editing booth, which is really the coffee table in my living room. I sit on the floor next to the couch. Anyway, that's uh, a, <laughs> that's all we've got for this one. Y'all join me tomorrow on stream live. It's Thursday. That means we get to do live spoilers, which is more fun and far easier for me. So I always look forward to it. <laughs> and you get to tell me live how you feel about my dumb opinions on cards and why they're dumb and why actually Dev, you're wrong about this. And it turns out that you can do this with this card. You called crappy to break the game. You can do that live. That's really fun. So join us over on Twitch, link in the description if you want to follow. Aside from that, if you don't catch us on Twitch, I'll have the VOD from that up as soon as I possibly can tomorrow night. But anyway, we are two days into spoiler season, and there's actually a bunch of kind of amazing looking cards in the set so far. So let me know how you feel about everything up to now. And that's about it. So do the YouTube stuff, like Patreon, support the channel, do all the stuff, share the video around, subscribe, blah, blah. Just do YouTube stuff for your favorite YouTubers. You know, you think, oh, I don't really like stuff. I don't really subscribe to channels. Oh, how much of a difference does it make? Massive, massive difference. If you like a YouTuber, hit the thumbs up for it. I'm telling you, it's, it takes no time out of your day. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to preach too much. I love you guys. I will see you later tomorrow. Um, Yeah, I'm dead from the place. I'm trying to remember my outro. <laughs> I'm dead from the place. <laughs> Thanks for watching, wizards. Spread love and be kind.